that's a great, nar great narrative summary of mine. So my honour today is to walk you through two of the sort of open methods that Lex already alluded to. The first being pre-registrations, and then I'll talk a little bit about reporting guidelines. But just in case you weren't there before, with a pre-registration, we're talking about records made a priori in principle before you start a data collection about the study design and the analysis plan you had that is then placed in an open repository. And when I'm talking about reporting guidelines, of course, I'm talking about the sort of minimal list of information that has to be specified for a study to be optimally useful. And those are typically used when you're writing up your manuscript. And in case you're wondering what sort of funny icon you're seeing here, those are actually journal batches. So there were a few journals that wanted to really, really promote pre-registration and they gave these batches to your publication. So here I took an example from the journal of Psychological Science. And here again is that little icon that was also shown on my first slide. But today, the structure of my talk is going to be very much focused on how do you actually do this. So I won't dwell a lot on the why, because I think Lex gave an elegant summary of that. I'll only do it to a very minimal extent. So we'll discuss the relevance of pre-registration reporting guidelines, what sort of types of pre-registrations there are, what sort of registries. There also are very much dependent on the type of research that you do. Um, these are the typical examples I'll go over. Some may be more, some may be less relevant for you. So just be selective and only note down what you want to note down. I'll share my slides after. And then, of course, we'll have a little bit of time to talk about reporting guidelines, also identifying the right guideline for your research. And if you're ever wondering why people became enthusiastic about pre-registration, then the drivers that Lex summarised are very nicely also fitted in here. So here you see the sort of standard uh, hypothetical deductive model, the empirical cycle that many of us are familiar about. And the only thing I'm just going to show you now is just the places in this empirical cycle where a lot of the problems and the drivers that Lex talks about, talked about actually show up. And because these problems come in, they, they can come in in so many faces, and they also can come in already when you're really designing and thinking of your study. This is also where pre-registration often, often comes in. So it's thought to sort of reduce what we call the researcher degree of freedom. All these sort of arbitrary choices sometimes, at least they can feel that way, that you make in this whole cycle of getting from having an elegant idea to really a, a sort of publishable manuscript. And as Lex already alluded, it's also thought that is by pre-registering your work, we can at least combat a little bit the publication bias, because it means that there is a record of the study conducted, its hypothesis, its research question, independently of whether it's actually in the published literature. But this seminar is about also research quality and how open methods can improve the quality of your work. And here it's, it's argued that pre-registration can strengthen the credibility or the transparency of your work. And we have, we have two ways in mind here. The first is that, you know, the openness of this information, like bear in mind, it's put in an open repository. That openness can encourage the researcher to carefully reflect on different study aspects and to systematically report on their design and their analysis choices. And the second that we have in mind is that the records about the study design, the analysis plan, they can help the reviewer or maybe later even the user or the reader of the study in assessing the study's quality because the pre-registration provides this sort of structured insight into how the study was thought out and how it was set up. And the landscape that we're currently seeing is that more and more stakeholders in the scientific system seem to be in favour of this practice. So here, when I talk of stakeholders, I'm thinking about particular funders that now mandate the work that they fund to be pre-registered. Uh, example that comes to mind, the Arnold Foundation, there are actually quite many more. We're thinking about professional societies and also, of course, a lot of journals where the top factors have really nice guide uh, to walk you through which journals explicitly endorse pre-registration. And of course, you know, pre-registration may remind many of you of actually registering and the registration of clinical trials that already came up in also the previous talk. So, you know, since 2005, the International Committee for Medical Journal Editors said we only public, want to publish trials that have actually been registered to very much mitigate the, the outcome reporting, selective reporting and other problems that Lex alluded to. Um, and we see somewhat of a similar approach now currently being applied to animal research, actually, with Germany being the first to launch an independent and tailored uh, registry. 
but maybe a little bit more important to this audience, we also see in the form of pre-registration, we see part of this practice actually expanding to what I would call observational research, cross-sectional research when you're doing survey research, maybe longitudinal research, where the pre-registration can really elegantly help you distinguish between which parts of your work are actually confirmatory, which confirm the hypothesis or idea you had before, and which were more exploratory that you maybe found out along the way, but that you didn't sort of predict in advance. So again, I'm here thinking of like survey related research or maybe observational studies. Um, and something I've personally worked on is extending this template to also be useful for tracking the transparency of qualitative research. Now, there are some obvious candidates when it comes to sort of registries and registries basically being the place where these pre-registration forms can then be, you know, found, stored and identified and when you can also see the study's progress. So some of these were already mentioned. If you're doing drug trials in the EU, you have to register with the UTRA CT, called the clinicaltrials.gov. And the ECTRP is man, uh, actually managed by the World Health Organization. This is the Animal Study Registry, and it's exactly this name that will get you to the registry in case you're interested. They're only starting to get a few pre-registrations in, but it's a very interesting development followed by a lot of discussion. And a little bit more relevant to perhaps this audience are these two candidates. So both the open science uh, framework and the website as predicted help you to um, pre-register a variety of study types, but that many of you I think will be engaged with if you're doing any sort of survey related, small experimental research uh, and the like. And then of course, another important one, because these, again, these are distinguished by the type of work that they do, is of course the Prospero if you're conducting systematic reviews. And when I talk to researchers about pre-registration, there are often two things that they're concerned about, and they already also appeared a little bit in, in the first talk. And the first, of course, but what if I'm scooped? Even if I, you know, uh, uh, as Lex already said, I can put my work out there, it will be timestamped, but it will be open. And what if someone else just, you know, snatches it and does it in a much better way than I did? Then, then why do I stand? And this is how the option of actually embargoing uh, your work. Uh, this is why this can be arranged. So many of these registries, and I know it from OSF by hard, actually allow your work to be embargoed for up to four years or up to a specific time point for you. So you can imagine if you're maybe doing a more politically sensitive study that you do want to pre-register, but you don't want your participants to find out exactly what sort of statement you'll be providing them with. So there can also be different reasons from being scooped where temporarily embargoing your work can be helpful. And the second fear is what if something goes wrong? You know, you put in all this work, you and your team had many careful discussions about how are we going to do this? How are we going to properly analyze our hypothesis? And then you find out something doesn't work or you overlooked something. And this, you know, timestamp thing is already out there in the open. Well, there are a few things you can do. First, if we're talking prior to data collection, you can actually make, of course, a new pre-registration and you can delete your old one. But what can also be done is that you can add a quick summary note where you explain the changes you made and the rationale for them. Um, and this can then still be automatically linked because a pre-registration is intended to be a good solid plan, but it shouldn't of course be a prison. So with that in mind, I thought I'll quickly walk you through what this then looks like and bear in mind it's oversimplified, but it may give you a little bit of an idea. Um, so say you want to pre-register and here I've chosen the OSF because I believe it probably the easiest registry for what the type of work that many of you will be doing. So first you'll be asked if you do this in association to an OSF project, it doesn't need to be the case. You don't need to create a project first. And then from this drop down menu, you're asked to select the type of pre-registration you want to do. Then firstly, you fill in a little bit of metadata, uh, very much in line with what Lee said before, because we want this we want your work and your pre-registration to be findable. Um, but these are very sort of general things. And here you can also add your relevant uh, collaborating researchers. Then, of course, you have to now comes the real big work where you have to specify the relevant details of your design. Are you going to sample? What sort of variables you're going to use? 
um, what your analysis plan is. And here for various parts, you can either sort of give a quick description, maybe you have already done some of this work, um, or you can sort of upload or add any files to this. Then of course, the, the platform doesn't let you register it without actually reviewing it, assuring everything is how you wanted it to be, that it really includes all the relevant parameters that you want to be in there. And this might also be a nice time to send this around to your collaborating members so that as a team, you can be happy with what's going to be out there. And then finally, if it's actually time to register, the platform will ask you, okay, how do you want this to appear? And this is where the option of embargoing also already comes in. And then even if you're now concerned, like what if I made a mistake the night after, what the um, would always have is automatically build as soon as you here click pre-register, you will still have 24 hours where all co-authors can actually say, no, 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 something still needs to be changed. So hopefully that assures you a little bit that you can also get out some like small mistakes before doing this. And if you need any support, OSF, if you click on help, it will relate you to the OSF guides where many of the slides that I also showed before are findable. So that's why we talked about pre-registration. And the idea is that pre-registration can improve the discoverability of your work. And hopefully also the quality of how you conduct your work. But it doesn't sort of necessarily guarantee good usability of your work. Because in order to allow others to really use your work effectively, you also have to report your work carefully and in a way that others can reproduce your methodology or they can take the evidence you present it and take it into their systematic review. And this is very much where the sort of relation between pre-registration and reporting guidelines comes in. So reporting guidelines, virtually all of them were sort of built to ensure that, you know, others can use or build on your work and that they, intain, they sort of contain these certain aspects that this community believes that readers need in order to critically appraise your study. And it has become apparent that at least in the past sort of 20, 30 years, we've seen quite a lot of studies that biomedical research reports across different subfields are fairly frequently incomplete with regard to all these relevant details that we need to assess the study quality. So this is where reporting guidelines were brought in. And <clears throat> excuse me. So also here, <clears throat> we see that they're endorsed by different stakeholders. So here again, I'm having funders in mind and you, perhaps even the good journals that you know that you would like to publish and you already know what sort of reporting guidelines are they encouraged. So here I'm flashing out just a few, like of course, um, we have the PRISMA for systematic reviews. We have the STROPE reporting guideline for observational studies, CONSORT familiar to those of you involved in RCTs. Um, two of these bit more novel candidates, maybe the START, if you're working with diagnostic or prognostic studies, a little bit more methodological. And there's the SPIRIT, that is actually for uh, study protocols and CORAC for qualitative research. But now you may think that's a lot and mine is not really in there, what do I do? So I just wanted to direct all of you to the Equator in that regard. So the Equator Network is a really great platform where they brought all of these things together. You can already see if you sort of first open their website you'll see a lot of what I just presented for different types of studies. You will see what sort of reporting guideline they have out there. And, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was specifically advised, hey, you're doing, when I started to do focus groups work, you might want to use the CORAC. Um, so I had my supervisor could advise me on what would be the most relevant one, but that may not always be the case. So if you want to get more information, you can go, and again, these links are also in here to what is called Good Reports. And there, there is this sort of tool that can help you identify which uh, reporting guideline you should use. So you can either just select what you are writing in here, and it will give you this sort of drop down menu again, where it's a little bit more intuitive to find what you may need. But as you could probably see here, it also says, do you need help in choosing? And if you do that, um, it asks you about two or three questions to figure it out. So here it's just asking me, okay, what type of article am I writing? So here in my case, of course, I was doing focus groups research, I was doing original research. And then it asked me, okay, you know, what, uh, where are my data from? What, what I've regarded? And I'm, I've been talking to people, I've been doing focus groups. 
And then it sort of gives you the option, okay, do you exclusively do qualitative methods, et cetera? And I said, yes. And then again, directs me back to either Corec or SQR. Um, and the reason why we sort of clustered these two <coughs> topics together is that they really, as you'll see also in a little bit, they're very interrelated and they make sure that you actually consider these similar topics related to quality, not just when writing up your work, which is normally when reporting guidelines come in, but also when designing your work. Um, so here I've just taken the Coric as an example. Um, and what you will find is that it will link you to the paper where you see the study that has been conducted, often a Delphi study, to come to this reporting guideline. And within there is the checklist of actual items. This is just the snapshot that I've taken. And there are some journals, I think the Nature series is one of them, that will ask you to actually submit answers to these sort of questions on the side of your manuscript. But the majority of journals would really appreciate it if you use this checklist in writing up your results in the first place to ensure that others can critically appraise them. And I just wanted to draw your attention as a final thing to some of the sort of similarities. So here, for example, you see the correct that asks about, you know, how were participants selected and also other questions about how they were approached. And you'll see that in the pre-registrations, we'll see a similar thing. Uh, so this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with many other qualitative researchers and actually also Wienicke. Um, and as you'll see here, if you put them sort of side by side, you'll see that similar topics have been considered both in the phase of designing your study and when writing up your study. So hopefully this is just one of the ways in which these two tools can mutually reinforce one another to ultimately make our work more transparent and more usable for the community that we wanted to use. Um, I'll add on a little bit of a critical note and an appeal to, to all of us. So I sat before, you know, reporting guidelines have been endorsed by many leading journals, professional societies, funders, but surveys and reviews actually examining the adherence to these reporting guidelines in the journals that endorse them have found mixed results. And what this shows, and I think that's true for many things in life, is that to endorse something is not necessarily the same as really enforcing it. And this is also why um, at least one of the, the surveys that did that by Baker et al said, it's still ultimately, you know, you as scientists in your roles as reviewers, as editors, but also as individual researchers, that are best equipped to assure that the manuscripts that you submit, that you review or that you approve, apply with the relevant reporting guidelines and adhere to the sort of relevant standards that we want to uphold in scientific practice. So that's hopefully also the call to you to engage in open methods. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamarinde. Yeah. Are there any questions? I was wondering, um, in Leg's talk, he, he said something about, uh, I have to look it up, I wrote it down, um, registered reports. And I was wondering, actually, when he, he, gave his, he, he explained that, I also had to think about pre-registration. Can you maybe say a little bit about that? Do you, would you advise, for example, when it's possible for in a journal to have this um, pre-registered report also to pre-register your study in for example, in, in an OSF, for example? So a really blunt way to say this is that registered reports are like pre-registrations on steroids. So they just go that sort of extra step further. And here, like if you pre-register, you put your stuff on an open platform for everyone to scrutinize it. But if you do register reports, then in that phase, you submit it to a journal and you actually solicit that sort of scrutiny from the relevant community. So they're, they're peers, it's just that registered reports goes that one step further. And when it comes to sort of encouraging what I would encourage to do, and it very much depends on the type of work that you are doing. I think that registered reports are a really elegant way of doing science because as Lex said before, they allow feedback at the time that we many of us can still benefit from feedback the most. Um, and we see a gradual greater uptake of registered reports but if you are in a field where the sort of the good journals in your field don't really do that yet I wouldn't want to push you to it but if you are in a position to be a sort of editor there in some of these journals 
then I would invite everyone to have a discussion if that would be a feasible thing for their journal, because I really believe that this is something we'll see more in the future. Yeah, yeah thank you. If I may, Tamarinda, I have a kind of follow-up question. Uh, where do the preprints come in? Because when you do a registered report, you don't need a preprint. That seems obvious. But when you do a pre-registration, do you recommend to do a preprint as well? And, and, and is there added value in that? Uh, yes, I would generally recommend everyone to do preprints because I think it's a great quick way to already disseminate your work. And as you said before, you might get feedback. But it might also just be a way to already for others to know that this sort of work is out there. Um, so where comes the added value of preprint? I don't really believe that is all too different for a regular study versus the pre-registered study. From a pre-registration, we, of course, we know what your plan was, but then we still didn't know the outcome. So I believe that, yeah, if you want to full, do this sort of full open cycle, and I, I know I showed the sort of typical empirical open cycle. And I very much believe more and more that we'll get an open science cycle. And then at the beginning in a sort of design phase, you'll see the pre-registration, but when it comes to publishing, you will first see a preprint and then only publication. I also have to think about core outcome sets. I don't know if you, if you are familiar with that, but then within your community, within your field, you also, um, actually reach consensus on which outcomes you, in a trial, for example, you will uh, collect and you will report as well. Um, and that is, of course, will be, if you do a pre-registration, you have to write down which uh, outcomes you will, um, you will collect and report. But I think that's also a nice, um, yeah, way to, um, to make more, you know, to, to also avoid um, selection, public publication uh, bias, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And what I'm what I'm really hoping for in the future is that we see a lot of these more tools being used in a more typically aligned way. Um, so that if you were to do a pre-registration in a field where there the sort of the 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 uh, there's consensus on which outcomes to report, that there would then be easy information for you to find that and to link back. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the sort of main concerns that's often voiced when we talk about open science, open methodology, pre-registration and the like is that. It's just going to take more time. Um, and to some extent, I see that. And to the other extent, I feel like, yeah, but we have a lot of terrain to win and actually sort of integrating these things into our workflow and also cutting out some of the duplication that researchers are now faced with. Um, and maybe that also relates to the previous comment about in which sort of registries we have to put our clinical trial results. I believe there's a lot of valuable time to be won if we can get clarity sort of there as well. So also by thinking better in the beginning about your methods, for example, you have to write it down because you're pre-registrating it. It will, you know, maybe save, save you from any problems that you will face later on. Of course, what we're hoping, we can never sort of predict that. Um, do, do try this at home, I would say. <laughs> I see some hands raised, uh, Gerian. Uh, yeah, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see the Net Netherlands trial register at your um, slides. Is there a reason for it? There is no reason. I've been utterly selective in sort of which ones to put on because there are so many. So maybe you're right and I should have put that one on instead of one of the others. There was no specific reason for that. Sydney. I'm not quite sure who to direct this to, and maybe it's a question or a comment that's already been posed. I think maybe to Tamarinda or maybe to Lex, I'm not quite sure. We're talking about preprints. Um, I, I have a bit of a concern. Isn't, isn't there a possible, possibility that there's a real danger that preprints gains its own life? And that is from, based upon the feedback that, that's given, conclusions, conclusions can be, uh, can be, can be changed. And if people are basing their uh, people, people only focus on the preprint, that um, in, in, incorrect conclusions are drawn. How how do you how Lex or Tamarinda? How do you how do you see this? The, I'll give this one to Lex because the he's people, the people. The people know know that 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 conclusions potentially could be could be changed on in, in a preprint. Yeah, well, you're right, of course, Sydney. I, I've got. 
three answers to that. Um, one is uh, there has been some research now um, on the question whether really things change between preprint and print. And the answer is no, hardly anything changes between preprint and print. Uh, so that should be reassuring. And the second thing is that preprints have this, this, this warning on it. Uh, that is, this is not peer reviewed. That, that did it used to be the case in, in clinical preprints, but in the COVID-19 times, it was um, invented quickly. And, and that's good, that's nice. Third answer is that you should never apply the results of a single study. Don't do that. Wait for the systematic review or even better, wait for the guideline. Yeah, I can, thank you, I can appreciate that, but I mean, we're, we're all we're all academics. We can we can we know how to assess the value of an individual study. The the question is whether the clinicians or those people who work in outside of academia are able to able to do that. Yeah, well, take take the French guy uh, with with the the weird medicine against COVID. Uh, uh, he has a preprint. He had publications. He had everything, and it was all flawed. Yeah. It remains a bit problematic. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I add an, an, uh, another question? Because I was uh, I had to sign something because I wanted to publish something, and then the journal requested me to re remove preprints after acceptance. Could that be this reason? Because I was I was surprised to read this actually. And yeah, well, that's 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 a difficulty. Uh, Mario Malici, uh, who worked in Amsterdam as well, but he's now in Stanford. He he is really the expert on preprints nowadays. He he studied a lot of them, and he found out that there is a lot of inconsistency out there. Some preprint servants even don't you allowed to to say that it is now really uh, a printed uh, and 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 to upload the PDF of that that version. And on the other hand, some journals, uh, most journals allow you to preprint, but some journals, yes, uh, uh, demand that you remove the preprint after uh, the publication is there. It should not be a big problem either way, because the idea is that there is only one DOI uh, and everything is linked. Um, so when you click not so stupid um, uh, as some people uh, are, are still uh, trying to do, you can find always f uh, find the most recent version and that is the published version then. And then to make it more complex, you now have journals like F1000 Research that allow versioning. And then when you have a an accepted printed paper, you can update it. And, and you guys know that because you're used to Cochrane uh, uh, reviews. We do updates there all the time, but now we do that with regular, regular papers as well in some journals. And then again, um, well, you occasionally you, you, you can hit the wrong version, but typically there is stuff installed that make pop up the, the latest version. 